Hi, everybody. Um, first of all, let me, I'm just gonna show you that Piggy's here so that there's no question he's part of the show. And then I'm going to say that this is where we're, we're having a program with a library, of course, and this came about because we have a book, which um, I have pictures of in the in the presentation. So, but rather than having a regular author visit talking about a book the whole time, I really wanted to talk about Piglet and Piglet mindset because that is the reason that we wrote the book. Um, it's not all that's in the book, but that is why we wrote the book, Piglet. So I'm going to share my screen and show you my Piglet mindset presentation that I give um, in this uh, a similar presentation to the classrooms, to, to the kids when we make a virtual visit. I change things around a little bit so that um, there are different videos. So if there are any kids that have seen it already, you might see similar, but at least a few different videos in here. So I'm going to share my screen. And um, go to here. Uh, and there we go. So why did it go to the second? There we go. OK, so I'm going to go through and I'll ask some questions of you. It's not a great interactive kind of um, platform. Uh, so I'm just going to talk. And then at the end, you can ask the questions. So uh, here we go. Here's Piglet on the beach. One of my favorite pictures of Piglet. And the question is, do you have a Piglet mindset? Uh, I am Melissa Shapiro, which you know. Um, I'm a veterinarian. My husband, Warren, is here on the call. Everyone that watches our social media pages knows that Warren is Piglet's favorite dad. Uh, he's also dad to our three kids, Rachel, Daniel, and Ellie. I'm a lifelong animal welfare advocate. That's what I, how I like to describe myself. This is me with my first puppy mill dog that my parents didn't know was coming from puppy mill, I think in Kansas and came across to New York on a train. But she lived a very nice life. She wasn't a well dog, typical of a puppy mill dog. Uh, this is my dog, April. When I was in vet school, I adopted her. She was um, made diabetic in a diabetes lab and she did contribute to the development of some of the glucose monitors that are in use today for diabetics. And this is me now um, with our six dog or seven dogs. Susie is in there and she is no longer with us. But in any case, um, I do plenty of dog and rescue work, which you will see. Here is um, our family. Piglet's family has always adopted and cared for dogs with disabilities and special needs. My first dog, the puppy mill dog was blind. And then from there, there have been others along the way. So uh, this is Warren and I when um, Warren when we met a um, long time ago, when we were first married with our dogs, April and Jamie. And then there's a smattering of others on here and our kids. Pigless inclusion pack, sort of going forward a little bit and then we'll explain, but these are our dogs, Annie, Dean, Evie, Susie, Zoe and Gina, and those are the dogs that welcomed Piglet into our house. They're all different sizes, different shapes, different colors, different breed mixes, different personalities, but they all come together as a very nice group. And when Piglet came, they led by Susie, they really did bring him into our house in, a, in just the most pleasant of ways as, as dogs. Did the microphone. Um, so it. now I can't get back. Okay. <laughs> Unmute or, or mute, please. Okay, so here are some birds that I've had um, and still have. Uh, they are also disabled. This little bird had one eye. She is a sparrow. That was baby bird, one of um, my most special pets along the way. And this is Lukita. He is here now. He's got splayed legs. And then the others are rescued sparrows with various issues. So Piglet, the deafblind pink puppy, came from a hoarding situation in Georgia. He's what's called a double dapple dachshund chihuahua mix, meaning that both of his parents were dapple colored, and he unfortunately got both of the dominant dapple colored dapple gene genes that dictate coloring as well as congenital eye and ear defects, and that is why he's deaf and blind. He came to us as a very, very anxious screaming baby. 
that's my description of him. Everyone's probably heard it if they know anything about Piglet and or read our book. So Piglet came screaming and we had to figure out how to communicate with him. We were fostering him, we weren't keeping him, but we needed to help him settle down. Our dogs helped us and we did a lot of holding and a lot of comforting for Piglet. This is what he sounded like. He screamed all the time. So the question I have for everybody to think about what it was like and why we had this issue, why he had this issue is to close your eyes, cover your ears and figure out how you're gonna communicate with somebody that you can't see or hear. And maybe you have to go to the bathroom. Maybe you have to, you wanna eat. Maybe you just wanna know where in the world you are and you can't figure it out. So here, this tiny little baby who fit in my hand came to our house and that's how he probably felt. I'm guessing that, but judging from the way he was behaving, I'm pretty sure that is what he, how he felt. And so what did we do? We took responsibility for him. We held him all the time. We taught him tap signals. We tried to help him feel included as did our other dogs. So if you think about a dog that's deaf and blind, what kind of accommodations do you think that he might need? We wanted him to feel safe and comfortable in our house. And we knew that safety was one of the most important, that that was our priority was to keep him safe. Obviously, we didn't want him falling down the stairs. We didn't want him falling off furniture. We took extra time for activities. We took lots of breaks because, and, and we still do because he needs to rest and recharge. He's, he's working on much less processing um, input capabilities than somebody who can see and hear. So we do all of these things for him. And while we're doing all of these things for him, teaching him tap signals and supporting him as he's facing his challenges, he puts in a very, very big effort as well. And that is how, um, he assures that he's part of what's going around on around him. This is what a, this is called a piglet mindset. So here is here is what we have. We take walks. Um, all the dogs are walking, and piglet is in a stroller. That's one of the accommodations that we offer to him because he can't take a walk like the rest of the dogs. So piglet maps his environment. Everyone wants to know how he does it, how he gets around without being able to see and hear. He, and if you think about it, what are the senses that he's using? He has a nose that works. He has paw pads that work. They can feel different ground coverings. There's carpet and there's wood floors. There's a mat outside. There's grass, there's rocks. There are places that he can recognize as he's walking around. So think about if you couldn't see in here, what would you use to figure out where you were? He has figured it out. He uses his nose to smell where he is and, he, and he's probably paying much better attention to scents and the, the ground coverings than another dog would who doesn't need to. So here he is walking around our kitchen table. So everyone wants to know what happens when we move the furniture. This is what happens. And then we put a new table back and I'm sure that you know what's about to happen. <laughs> so we moved the table, we put a new table and he knew a table was there already because he has the room mapped. 
But what would happen if we don't, if we move the table over and in fact, he would bump into it to start with. He is careful when he moves around and he would immediately realize that the table had moved and he would stop bumping into it in future, um, in the future. So how does he do it? How does he know where everything is? I just answered a lot of those questions. Um, he does it outside as well. So Piglet, Piglet finds his way to our back door. This is one of his signature moves. And it's also an example of how a dog maps their environment when they can't see and hear. He probably tracks in using his nose. And he then also, once he gets to the, the bottom of the stairs, feels a slate. He walks up the wood stairs using his body to touch and feel where he's going, as well as his nose to know when he gets to the top. There's a doormat and then he knows where the door is. I can sometimes open the door and he won't know it's open and he'll just stand there because he can't see it opening. And then he has to wait for what? He has to wait for hit, for the, the smell of the house or the air uh, change in, in temperature. He might notice then to go in or I give him a little signal and he goes in. So his sense of smell is probably his um, window to the world because he can figure out and know where he is at all times. And he even knows how many people are in a room, who's in the room, who's come and left the room. He knows when I'm leaving the house to, to go downstairs to get something out of the washing machine or dryer versus when I'm leaving the house to actually get in my car and drive away. I don't know how he knows it. He is very, very well aware. And most of the reason he can, that, that he is aware is that he, he uses his nose. He, he watches with his nose the way that the other dogs move around. He can tell when they're barking and he can tell when everyone's excited versus relaxed. So he uses his nose and also just gets a sense of what's around him because, through experience. So here's what a dog's nose looks like when it's working really, really hard. So a deaf and blind person does not use their nose like a deaf and blind dog. But since he is a dog, if you look at the way he, he moved his nose there, you don't see many dogs moving their noses like that. And the reason that he is is that he can't see and he is literally using that nose to determine what side of the room things are and, and, and dogs' noses are, so, are capable actually to differentiate different smells at the same time that are in different places in a room. So it's a very powerful organ and Piglet has learned how to use it because he wants to, he wants to feel part of everything. So here um, is Piglet's sense of touch and communicate as we communicate with Piglet through tap signals. So um, this is because I can't show you this in this presentation, I'm gonna show you this video of the way that Piglet um, has learned to go to his bed. He's quite a character. And then I'm gonna take a break here and show you the way that he does his tap to signals on the floor. So here he is. So I've given this little squeeze over the top of him and he wants to make sure that I'm following him and he shouldn't have stopped there. And he is very blind. There. So we, I, I taught him this when, when you're marking behaviors in dogs that can see and hear, it's no different than marking behaviors in a dog that can, can't see and hear. So as he's doing what I want him to do, I label it, give him a treat for doing it. He catches on to know that that's what I want. And he then has learned the tap. So I'm going to go ahead and just show you because everybody also really likes to know 
how Piglet learned to um, do these tap signals. So hopefully this is going to stay up here. Okay, so there's Annie <laughs> laying on the um, laying on her on the, that horrible blanket that we have. So anyone who knows us and has followed us on social media knows that that's the special blanket that Susie liked and we still have it, even though it's all ripped up. And that was in my parents' house. My mother is on here and she probably recognizes this pink flowered blanket. So I'm Anna, you gotta move over. So Piggy's gonna go here. Okay, Anna, you move there. And Piggy's there, where's Eve? Okay, Evie, Evie, come on. So you can see that Zoe likes to do the, this is called the Piglet Show. In order to get Piglet to learn to sit, I um, had to get him to sit. So I lured him up like this with a tree. And as his nose went up, his butt would go down. That's what we do with puppies when we're teaching them. So when his butt went down, I would give him a tap. And within a few uh, times only, he learned. We went on to teach him down. No, 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 where you where are you going? Do you down? And to wait down. And then he learned to come like that. And then he knows to sit because I would tell him sit when I, when he, and then this is okay. And then I give him this treat, Zoe. Oh, and here's Evie. So the way that I, the way that I marked these other behaviors, you come on over. Here. One of the things that I really wanted him to do was know to wait because obviously we want to take his picture. And also, I want him to behave himself when I'm in a store or someplace that I need him to just kind of chill out. It doesn't always work, but it's also really cute. And he loves to do his, his tricks for people. And that gives him something to do. It gives him something to interact with us doing. Otherwise, he's all alone. So if he gets to do something like this, it's enriching for him. And the other dogs enjoy it also. So here he is. One of the things that I also taught him to do. Oh, so so I, I was gonna go just go back real quick. To get him to wait, I just stood in front of him. And when he stayed for even a few seconds, I gave him his okay signal, which meant a treat was coming. And also it did not take him very long to learn that he's just gonna sit still and then he's gonna get a treat. I started to label it with the, this tap on his nose to wait and then I started to move back and eventually he, he knew to stay. Another trick that I taught him is to give his, to shake. Again, you see this on here, sit. Oh, I'm telling him sit, but he can't hear me. Okay, there he goes. And he does shake. Zoe does not do shake, she does down. Oh, and then one other thing that I normally say first, which I didn't, is that Obviously we have to do tap signals with a deaf and blind dog. It, these dogs can see and hear, so I do both verbal signals to them and hand signals. But a deaf dog, so a deaf dog can see hand signals and a blind dog can hear verbal cues, but the deaf and blind dog has to be touched. But also the deaf and blind dog could be, have uh, someone blow to them. Come on over here, you went to, but if there's a breeze in the room, then they don't find the person who's blowing at them. <laughs> okay, there you go. Anna, would you like a cookie? Okay, that's the piglet show. Um, hopefully that explains some of the hows. There you go, Anna. Okay, so let me put this back up here. Okay, we're back. There we go. All right, got to go to the next slide. So a piglet mindset is facing challenges with a positive attitude, focusing on what you have and moving past what you don't. And I just added with optimism, flexibility, perseverance, and resilience. And I added that to my shortened statement because a piglet mindset is really a growth mindset. And growth mindset is optimism, flexibility, perseverance, resilience, and empathy. It is also accepting individual, uh, a pigment mindset is also accepting individuals for who they are and including them despite their differences, having empathy and understanding towards others and following up with positive actions. And it is being kind to all. And that is what we have as Piglet's inclusion pack. So we teach kids in the schools, maybe some of the kids on here have had Piglet mindset in their schools, maybe 
you would like to have some have piglet mindset in your school if you're teachers this is uh what a piglet mindset is so here's piglet just to follow up about the tap signals so he knows to wait because I taught him tap signal, which is a little tap on his head, which I don't think was in that video. And he's very literal about it. So he will lick the bowl, but not eat the food. Uh, this is an example of Piglet having perseverance and resilience. He is perseverant. Whatever he's doing, he's doing it with, um, and, and he will practice doing it if he can't do it well the first time. But here he is, and he bumps into the gate, and he bounces back. It's a very simple example of being resilient. It's the basic model. But when people see this, they are inspired to be resilient because they see Piglet, a tiny little dog, moving past a challenge. And here he is uh, as a follow up to that video. Piggy, come on, don't like mommy. I got to shorten this video, but here it comes. It was worth the wait. So there he goes through without hitting the gate, which is usually what happens. Here's another resilience video, which I also really, really enjoy showing, and you'll see why. So Piglet is blind. He actually doesn't know that the floor is a foot from where he was standing or 10 feet. It could be anywhere because he really can't see. He trusts me. I'm not going to tell him to jump if he can't, if he's going to hurt himself. He knows that. And he does jump up onto there. So he's got to have some idea that he didn't jump from, you know, <laughs> but he is a very cautious dog. And you know, I, I just when I watch him do something like that, for me to, to watch him build up that kind of confidence, it's really rewarding for all that we put into him, Warren and I and the rest of our crew. Um, and here he is being a really happy dog out in our yard. So there's not much more to illustrate optimism than seeing a deaf and blind dog running around their backyard in that kind of happy. Uh, he's a very flexible dog. And these are all illustrations to for piglet mindset and growth mindset. Um, he can go in a stroller, he takes a walk, he can be carried. This is one of my favorite videos of Warren with piglet. So he, he, he didn't want to be in a stroller that day. He wanted to walk with his dad. And then those little girl dogs that we have as part of the group, I watched this video hundreds of times. Um, and it does show just how flexible he is and how flexible we have to be to have him with us. So we also have a piglet mindset. And piglet draws empathy from people, compassion. You have to feel something towards a dog that's this adorable and this disabled, really. <laughs> Um, so that is Piglet mindset. And then we move into Piglet's inclusion pack. And I call them Piglet's all accepting, inclusive and kind dog pack. This is a picture taken by my friend Joan Carruthers for our book. It's on the back cover of the book. And it is one of the best pictures I've seen of seven dogs all standing together looking quite amazingly cute and uh, attentive. So they, I already said, they're all different colors and shapes. They're a great example for uh, children and adults to look at and realize what inclusion really is and, and how, how accepting each other 
leads to such a, a nice um, positive feeling. Here is the way that our dogs are accepting of Piglet. At night, Piglet walks around in circles in the bathroom while I'm brushing my teeth. And the other dogs, Zoe and Evie are in the, in the bathroom with me, usually on this towel or bath mat. And they just stand there and he walks around them. And I think that, again, it's illustrating how accepting they are of someone who is really quite different because most dogs don't want another dog walking around them in circles around and around and around, but they know he's a little different. This is what he does and they're used to it. And it's, it's the norm in our house. Um, here is here are the, is the group. They love working together. They all, when I, when I give Piglet his tap signals, they respond by, um, you know, understanding what he's, what he's being told. And, and I then of course speak to them. So they all have their own way of communicating and uh, they like to work together. Piglet's pack of six dogs sets an example for us too. Accept others for who they are, include them despite their differences, show empathy and compassion for others and be kind to all people and animals. This is them at work together. So I told him to sit, but he, I turned the video off before he sat. But in any case, you can see how everyone knew what they were supposed to do and they really get into this. Um, what does inclusion really look like in our house? Piglet's dog family understands and accepts that he's a little different from them. Piglet feels confident because he's always included. We take him for walks, we take him wherever we go. He's literally never left out. And part of the reason is that he won't allow himself to be left out. He insists that he's included and he is included. Um, they're extra gentle and kind to Piglet. He bumps into them all the time. Uh, when they're playing together, you'll see the way that Zoe plays with him in this little video, but they, they, they're more gentle with him than they are with each other. And they really do understand that he needs a little help in finding them sometimes and they go to find him they, they he smells their breath and that's how he knows where they are but sometimes they move and he can't find them he's he's going the opposite direction they help him to live his best life despite his many disabilities and challenges by accommodating him and um as i've said they're also very supportive of each other they love each other these dogs especially when susie was here susie annie and dean would lay on the couch together they, they were like a, a tight, tight little trio. And then the other three would come with me, with Piggy. But then when they were all together, they would go off in pairs. They, they're really quite a, a nice um, little pack of dogs. Um, so here is Zoe playing with Piglet. And you can see what she does. <laughs> she taps him. And you can see, he can't see where she is, but he knows she's there because he can smell her breath. He can smell her. I don't think there are a lot of dogs that would play with him like this. She figured this out right from the very beginning when she realized that he actually couldn't hear her or see her. And she was standing in the middle of the room barking at him and he, wasn't, he was sleeping. And I, I had said to her, you know, it's gonna be a lot of fun from here. So what is inclusion? Inclusion means that everyone belongs no matter what their differences are. How do we include? We make sure that we respect others and help them feel that they are part of the group. And this is especially on the playground in different organizations, whether it's for kids or adults. 
And then I ask everyone to think about how do you plan on being inclusive at school, at camp, at home, playing sports? This is for kids, but for adults in whatever groups you're going to and whatever family gatherings and, and other organizations you're a member of. Here's a little reminder. So are you ready to join Piglet's Inclusion Pack? Do you have a Piglet mindset? And um, that means, again, I'm saying this over and over because it's so important. <laughs> Facing challenges with a positive attitude, accepting others for who they are, including others despite their differences, having empathy and understanding towards others, following up with positive actions, meaning when someone needs help or support, you actually are there for them, and always being kind and considerate to all people and animals. So I have these, um, this is a Piglet, Piglet's Inclusion Pack membership card and a Piglet sticker, which I send to all the classes. The teachers um, contact me and say, we're using Piglet Mindset in our class. And as part of our nonprofit, we send these membership cards. This is uh, front and back, obviously, of this card. It's a business card sized card. It's a place for the kids to sign. It has what you need, the requirements to be in Piglet's Inclusion Pack. And then of course, this beautiful picture of our dogs. So the teachers then use our materials online and they uh, teach the kids about Piglet, Piglet mindset, facing challenges with a positive attitude. And then uh, one of the PowerPoints that's online that are all free for download is Piglet's Inclusion Pack. So then the, the Piglet's Inclusion Pack membership cards goes with that. Um, PowerPoint, but Piglet Mindset is a program that is online on our website, which is pigletmindset.org. Teachers can download five different PowerPoint presentations with lesson plans that give an idea, a guide for using the materials throughout the school year. Everyone can use it however they like to fit their own teaching styles, but it's all there. And then there's also an activities uh, PowerPoint. I think there are 10 different activities that go along with our educational materials. When the teachers are using Piglet in their classroom or scout uh, leaders are using it with their scouts or church uh, teachers are using it with their church groups, whoever and wherever it's being used, we will make virtual and or in-person well, or in person um, visits depending on COVID situation and location which enhances the program. It, it, it um, is really exciting for the kids to see Piglet, even if it's on a virtual live um, meeting. I just wanna go back. This is me in Massachusetts with Piglet with the kids around. And then this is the first Piglet Mindset poster that was made in uh, Plainville, Massachusetts by Trisha Frigeau, who is a third grade teacher who coined the phrase Piglet Mindset when she decided to use Piglet's videos to show her students, uh, uh, to teach them about growth mindset. So this poster is actually in our house on the wall. It's very large, but the teachers now make different size posters. The kids make individual posters. They make a whole class poster, but it's the way that they start out the year is talking about what a Piglet mindset actually is. And of course we have our book, which is, Piglet, the unexpected story of a deafblind pink puppy and his family. The book is about Piglet, of course, it's called Piglet, but the book is really more than Piglet. And anyone who watches our social media pages that thinks it's only Instagram and Facebook and they don't need to buy the book, they need to buy the book because the book is also about me, my life as a veterinarian caring for animals, my husband, his life, Warren, favorite dad that everybody, who everybody loves, our kids, things that we've done with our kids that have worked really well. It's a very positive book. There is really very little um, uh, negative in the book, but 
we try to you know bring in some controversy here and there. Well, in any case, um, there's there's vet medicine. There's a lot of dog care, pet care, special needs animal care, uh, lots of rescue information, dog training information, and the reviews have been so positive. Uh, if anyone is questioning or or uh, wondering what the book is like and how people have felt about it, I would send you to some of the online reviews as well as our Facebook page when we talk about the book. Uh, the comments are heartwarming, heartfelt, very positive, and most you can uh, bring a tissue because you will cry from what people have said about our book. And when you read the book, you also need to have tissue sitting next to you because that is what is reported I could hardly narrate the book when I had to, um, I did the audiobook narration and I had to stop multiple times every day that I recorded for hours because there was such um, emotion in the book. And I think that everyone will really enjoy it if you haven't read it. The book is available at bookstores, online, wherever books are sold. It's going to be out in the UK, September 16th, and it's in Canada now, it's in Australia, if there's a question, you can contact me and pigletmindset.org has information about the book. We're having a kid's book coming in June, 2022, which is a little story. It's a, it's a um, very sweet story about Piglet and the other dogs as Piglet came home. Uh, here's an Amazon review of our book, which um, I don't need to read to everybody. It's a very nice positive review. Um, and this is the cover of the book. Just wanted to mention our nonprofit, which is Piglin International Inc. We formed the nonprofit in December of 2019 to support the educational program Piglet Mindset, as well as our support for uh, special needs dog rescue organizations. Uh, it, it's um, when when we have when people donate to the nonprofit, the money goes, the donations go to supporting, as I just said, administrative costs, uh, insurance costs, actually putting on the programs in the schools, sending the stickers, and also expanding as we're trying to do to reach more and more kids around the world, certainly in the US. And then I sell, I sell t-shirts. I don't know if you can see this t-shirt, but this is Piglet's, uh, our pack of dogs. And I have sold um, almost 10,000 shirts and raised almost $100,000 selling shirts. And probably, probably about 70,000 has been donated to um, dog rescue groups. Okay, that's Piglet Mindset, Piglet International. And um, so here, Supporting, supporting Piglet International, donations. We um, sell merchandise. This is some of our merchandise. Book sales, we're giving, if we ever, if, if we do make a profit on the book, um, a portion will go to Piglet International. And also I have just uh, started offering these book plates, which can be personalized uh, through the nonprofit. So with a minimum donation of $15, I will send you a book plate and information about that is on pigletmindset.org. Okay, so Piglet's mission, which I haven't gone over, is to advocate for and support rescued animals through education and fundraising, inspire and motivate others to adopt special needs pets. And we get lots of notes from people telling me that because of Piglet, they just adopted a uh, blind dog or a three-legged dog or a dog in a wheelchair. It's a really nice feedback for Warren and I uh, to get from our followers and people that follow uh, Piglet. Facilitate Piglet mindset in the schools, encourage acceptance, inclusion, empathy, and kindness through the example of Piglet's inclusion pack and to put a smile on faces all around the world. And most people that see Piglet Smile, they have no choice. Here's the group. No piggy. So I, the reason I have this video on here is that one of the things that we do is we do support other organizations, rescue groups, 
And this is a rescue group in uh, Washington State that has a, a yearly um, campaign to raise awareness for shelter dogs. All of our dogs are shelter dogs. And that was a little sign on the, on the couch that I had saying that they're supporting the, the campaign. So here's the final bit of inspiration. If everybody remembers back, Piglet was teeny when, we, when he arrived at our house. He was so small that the thought of him walking upstairs was really quite um, not really in the realm. But in fact, here he is. So that's in the beginning. And this is now. He looks very handsome in that white t-shirt also, I know. <laughs> uh, okay, so thank you for joining us for, for this little presentation. I hope there will be questions because I, I didn't, I, I really didn't realize it was this short. I was gonna make it a little longer, but anyway, um, the website, pigletmindset.org, any questions from teachers or parents, you wanna have Piglet Mindset at your scout troop, whatever. You can find me at piglet, pigletmindset.org, pig, pinkpigletpuppy at gmail.com, our Instagram at pinkpigletpuppy, Facebook, piglet the deaf line, pink puppy, and TikTok for kids that are on there, pink piglet puppy. This is my favorite video. We're missing Susie, but still my favorite video. So thanks to Warren, he lets me have all these dogs and he lets me go take a walk with them. <laughs> all righty, there we go. Well, thank you so much um, for sharing Piglet's story with us. Um, for anyone who joined later, um, we are gonna have a Q&A, but, um, but we do ask that you use the chat function um, and I will ask your question on your behalf. Um, so if anyone has a question, please uh, type it in now. Um, there are some questions in there already, which I'll ask you, but I wanted to first say that one, there are um, people from all around the United States on, as well as from Canada and um, Australia. Those are the people who have identified where they're coming from. I'm, <laughs> I'm sure there's even, even more places represented. So you have a wide, Piglet has a wide uh, range uh, wide range <laughs> so um but um also there are just plenty of people just talking about just making comments about how adorable yeah. it is of course and how wonderful you and warren as well are in taking care of these animals and how lucky they are to have you and how lucky you are to have them so um but um i uh let's see i did want to start out first of all um asking um uh how long did it take for Piglet to be comfortable around the other dogs, around people? And, and how is it that he can be so comfortable around groups of children? I mean, it's, it's pretty phenomenal. Was it at a process or? Yeah, Piglet, Piglet came into the house pretty confident despite being really anxious and screaming all the time. When I brought him into the house, there's an extensive description of this in the book. <laughs> The, the short version is that he said hi to everybody. They said hi to him. I was asked about why I would, in the world I would put down a tiny one pound dog with six other dogs around him. And that the answer is that I knew the other dogs would be fine with him. And he was so tiny, he certainly posed no danger to any of them. But he, um, you know, he was friendly and they were friendly to him. They immediately a few of them decided they wanted nothing to do with him and they left and went up on the couch and they could they knew that they could be away from him they weren't forced to be with him but Susie in particular and Zoe by default because she's the same size and was stuck in the kitchen with them really were especially comforting to him Susie took responsibility and would lay with him 
in the kitchen. We would call to her to come to lay with him in the kitchen because he was so upset. And I, I would, so, so the initial introduction was relatively quick, but the, the calming down and becoming part of the group took quite a few weeks and took a lot of work. Warren and I held him, I hardly went to work. And, you know, ultimately he realized there was a routine that he could count on and he didn't have to worry about the things that he clearly was worrying about. As far as taking him places, he, once he knew he was part of we, what we were doing in the family, he was really happy to go. And initially he didn't want to go in the dog crate in the car. And he got used to that over, you know, a couple of months. Uh, and um, going into the classrooms and going to events and places is challenging because he is working on three out of five and taste really doesn't count. Although it does, it does count to some extent because he's highly food motivated. So when we take him places, he does, re, I, and I rely on treats to get him to kind of focus, you know? But he needs a lot of downtime. So when he goes into the classes, he's not a dog that's going to be having everyone handling him and they're not all around him poking at him. And one of the things that I tell the kids is to imagine not being able to see and hear and having all of your friends come and start poking you. And they immediately step back and know that that is not what they should be even considering doing with a dog like this, especially the size of a dog and this temperament of a dog. He's, he's a high strung dachshund chihuahua. He's very typical. So he enjoys meeting the kids. He enjoys meeting new people but his, he has a limit to how long and, and how much he's going to do. He likes to play tug. He diverts attention and he wants to play tug with a toy or a leash when he meets the kids. So he does his tricks. I have buffer dogs, namely Evie now because Susie isn't here, but, and the kids can do whatever they want with those dogs. So we, we have a nice balance in the group to balance Piglet's extra needs, you know. Um, <clears throat> one question, um, uh, Piglet looks so dapper in his sweaters and shirts, uh, and there, the person is wondering whether it's for warmth or for security or what, what the reason is for those sweaters. Well, in initially it was because he was really cold. It still is because he, he gets cold. So I initially, in the beginning, I think I didn't have shirts on him. I might have a little t-shirt for him, but because he did come in March and it was still cold out, but through that first summer, I, I wasn't someone who put shirts on my dogs. He has no hair underneath at all. He's completely bald. I can show you that um, he, he has white fur on the top of him here, but on his head and his ears, it's very thin. And then underneath, you can see he's bald. So he does get cold. We put the shirts on at him. I think it does help with some comforting um, just to have a shirt on, but he doesn't require it. Okay. Um, and someone asked, um, can you talk a little bit about why you teach him to wait and sit and, and these other, you know, quote unquote tricks? Um, what is the point? And is it, is it mean to make him wait? <laughs> oh, well, that's one of the accusations on the social media pages is, and, and many people have said it, and I think it's really a good thing for dogs and people to have some um, uh, control over their impulses. And one of, the, one of the ways we can do it easily to teach impulse control in dogs is to have them waiting to eat. Is it cruel? Uh, I personally don't think it's cruel. You can put a bowl of food in front of me and I'll sit and wait to eat and it's not the end of the world. You know, people sit down to eat meals and everyone waits for everyone to be served. What's the difference? So for Piglet to learn to wait, it's just something else that he has to think about instead of being alone and doing nothing. He would be more than happy to dive into the food, but if you watch him, he sits there, he's pretty happy with the whole trick. It's just another trick for him. And it's a way for him to interact with me or Warren, whoever's doing this with him. Uh, and it's multi-stepped trick. You know, he's got to sit, he's got to wait. He has to not touch the food with a tap on his head. So he's, he's doing three tricks at the same time. And why is that important that he waits, as I just said, but just the, the wait 
not wait for the food, but the regular wait is also important. Now he's sitting with a group. He's part of a show. He enjoys all of this. And it's really nice for him to have a repertoire of tricks. Warren, do you have anything else to add? Yeah. Warren, do you have anything else to add? No, I just think, oh. you know, I mean, we, we've discussed, you and I have discussed that a lot and people have said, it, it's it's not because I think there's there's merit in it, but it it's all about communication. We we could tell him good boy, but we have to have a sign or a, a tap signal for that, which Melissa does. It's a, a tap on the chest, but it's much more meaningful if it's in response to something he's done. He really is a dog without wanting to anthropomorphize him too much who's very proud of himself. You can see the way he walks, the way he sits up. And that's been something that he grew into. When he was a puppy, he was just fearful. And now he's a very proud little guy. Um, someone had um, a rather specific question, so I'll ask and um, then we can get to some more general things as well. But um, the person writes, um, I know Piggy jumps up on the dishwasher is it because he smells something? Um, and does he jump up on other similar things or smaller things? Now, well, the video of him on the dishwasher, he he put himself up there. He does, I don't know how he figured out. He does, you know, he uses his body to feel where he is. So he smelled food, dirty plates in the dishwasher at, at some point back a while ago. And he can feel where the, the dishwasher is. He, he figured out how to jump up there. I did not help him. I definitely didn't encourage it, but when he does it, it's so cute that I, I don't really care. I, I move him off of there. I don't want him to get hurt, first of all, or eat anything that he shouldn't. Not that we have food in the dishwasher, but he likes to lick the plates like any other dog. But when he went up there and then he had to get down, I, I, he, was, he barks to me to get him down. Uh, I usually take him down before he wants to come down. So. I just thought that video was so adorable of him, but um, yeah, he's, he, he figures it out. He's just like the other dogs. He wants to go up there and, you know, he doesn't, but he doesn't jump on anything else because he's too small. So that is literally the only thing that he jumps up on. Um, and someone asks, um, how long did it take to totally train him? Like how long, how long was the process? When, when do you, when, how long did it take till he was trained in the tap, tap signals? Well, the taps, I, I, I started doing the taps when he was, when he just got here, when he first got here. So he was teeny and he learned sit within, you know, really a few minutes. And then I just started teaching him more taps. So it was a long process, but because I kept adding things and I still added, I'm adding new things. Yet the other day they were crawling. So they like to learn new tricks, the dogs. I'm, I forget that I should be continuing to teach them new tricks. My daughter reminds me that I need to teach them new new tricks because this is boring to watch him do the same thing all the time. But he, um, he, he learned right away. Once he knew that he was gonna be tapped and it meant something, then he was very receptive. So I would say, if you wanna know how long it took, it took five minutes. But the number of things that he knows has taken years because I just think of something new to, to show him. The going to your bed that I showed at the very beginning of this little presentation, uh, with the little squeeze above over his, the top of him that we did last year. And now he's, and he's actually changed it because if I tell him to go from too far away, he wants to make sure that I'm following him. So he does these little twists and he's looking up with his nose to make sure that I'm following him to his bed where I'm going to give him the food. Cause he doesn't want to go to his bed unless there's a treat at the end. So. <laughs> He's pretty funny and he has a great sense of humor, really. He's a very funny dog and he knows it. Um, someone actually asked, what is his favorite treat? Oh, Piglet will pretty much eat anything. There's, there was one dog treat that he wouldn't eat. I don't even remember what it was, but he likes vegetables. He eats broccoli, he likes lettuce. He eats eggs um, in the morning with the birds. They like carrots. And then I have these Charlie Bear treats. We're Debachi's Bakery now, Stella and, che Stella and Chewy's and some, you know, whatever isn't real garbage, I I'll give them. Um, 
and they'll him he and the other dogs they'll, they'll eat they're not fussy he's highly food motivated um someone asked um how long it took to for the for piglet to be yours and you to be his you know was it an immediate connection or uh, did it take time to have that special special connection no it, it was definitely not an immediate anything because we were very determined not to have that happen so we just sort of fought it and ultimately uh and my father's there laughing he's my father's on here laughing because everyone knew except for us look at everyone thought they knew except for us but warren mm -hmm. and i were not keeping this dog so uh -huh. since um since we weren't keeping the dog that we were not getting attached to, the, to him but of course i felt very protective of him immediately and i was very attached to him right away and i really really had all intentions of finding him a place that would be uh the best possible home and as it turned out he was not leaving and that was that <laughs> and if you want to read about it it's in the book um so um, there are other questions specifically about Piglet, but I'll, I'll make it a little more general for a minute. Um, how hard is it to be a parent or be an owner of a, um, of a disabled dog? I mean, you're a vet and an expert, right? So it's probably a little easier for you. I mean, I assume you, you do in fact recommend that people adopt these dogs, but what, what kind of challenges like? Well, first of all, there is a wide range of disabilities. So when you say a disabled dog, a disabled dog could be a dog with diabetes. It could be a dog with um, uh, paralyzed in the back end that needs to have their bowel and bladder expressed a few times a day and have a wheelchair, chronic urinary tract infections. That's a pretty disabled dog with pretty, you know, high maintenance in to some in some respects there can be dogs with three legs that's a disabled dog or a deaf dog that are relatively easy to take care of there's not much extra to do other than to keep them safe in the case of a deaf dog and with fencing and leashes the blind dogs the same you have to keep them safe they can hear you so you're you're able to communicate on a very very basic level with these animals and then you get into dogs like this piglet who's deaf and blind definitely takes more thought, but it becomes very natural and normal once the dog is integrated into the family. So you have to want to do it and you have to take the time. And if you have a needy one like him, you have to put in a lot of extra time. There are also neurologic dogs with cerebellar hypoplasia that are mild and just sort of wobble around, but get around easily. And then there are the ones that can hardly walk or can't walk at all. And people choose to keep them also. So the, there's a wide range. And what I suggest is if you want to get involved with having quote, special needs pets, that you look at your own lifestyle, just as you would getting any animal, bringing any pet into the house or a child, if you, you know, you're not going to have a kid if you're never home and you're, you're traveling every, everywhere, every week, what, how would you have a kid? So you're not gonna have a dog either, but examine your own lifestyle. Where do you live? What other pets do you have? Who's there to help you? Who's part of your family? What's your experience level? Are you comfortable taking in an animal that needs something extra or not? If you aren't, get something that doesn't need that. But if you want to, then there are so many resources online now on, on the social media pages that you can get information about any disease, any disability, and see what people are doing. And if you end up with an animal that has a disability, it's very easy to find resources to support you through your vet. Some of the vets have clients that, that have animals with similar issues. They may be help, helpful to you. And then obviously there's a social networking on, on social media. There are groups that uh, have members with dogs in wheelchairs and blind dog rescue Facebook pages, groups that are supportive of each other. So you can find pretty much whatever, you, whatever you're looking for. And that is comfort to people. You do not have to be a vet. It's easy to be easier to be a vet and have dogs like this because I don't have the vet bills that other people have, but I have to put the same amount of time in. It's not easier for me. I just want to do it. So I do it. Yeah. 
Some, someone uh, suggest or asked um, whether or not you've considered making a book for children on Piglet or the, or the one that you are have coming out um, to do it in Braille. I actually was asked that question and that is the, uh, the answer was that it's up to the blind organizations. And I was actually gonna call Helen Keller Services, I think, whatever the organization is and ask them, they have to do it, the publisher is not gonna do it. So it's usually done by groups that focus on people that are blind that will make the books in Braille. So gotcha. if somebody's asking and they have contacts at one of those organizations, I think it would be amazing to have our book in Braille. Uh, a woman who is deaf and blind has read the book using the ebook, which goes into her computer and translates to Braille for her to read it in Braille. So there are uh, text to Braille readers that people can use also. Okay. Um, and um, again, just a lot of people saying they love the book. They love what you do. They're inspired by you. And that speaking of Helen Keller, that you're like the Annie Sullivan to oh, yeah. think. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, I mean, that's that's sort of the main, if anyone has any other questions, now's the time to, to type them yeah. in. Um, one other question actually is um, that someone was wondering like um, if, if there's an off day, you know, does Piglet have off days? You know, everybody has an off day. Does Piglet have an off days? Oh yeah. Oh, Piglet, yeah, Piglet, um, Piglet has a nickname of Grumpy Man. So he's not always happy Piglet. Sometimes he's Grumpy Boy. And sometimes he gets mad at, come here, this one, because she's really annoying. And he will turn away and get upset and he'll come and put his head on my shoulder or if he's with Warren, or he'll just turn away and walk away from the dogs. So he's not always the joyous creature that we show, but usually he's really positive and he's part of a group and he's part of his life. He's really, he is a really, really happy dog. Warren, do you want to chime? This is your thing. <laughs> yeah, I think the thing, I think that Piglet's lesson for me personally is that he finds joy in life despite his challenges. And we all have challenges. And it doesn't seem like most of us have challenges that are as significant as his. And he really does have a positive approach. He looks to have fun. He likes to have a job. He really wants to connect with people. And um, I, I think it's, you know, we don't, we don't have a lot of videos of him bumping into things. People say, well, it looks like he can see because, you know, how many videos of him bumping into things would people want to see? He does bump into things, but not really all that much because he is so good at, at setting, um, at developing these cognitive maps of his surroundings. So uh, he really is that positive and um, he is a lot of fun, but you know, he can't be grumpy. When he's grumpy, he's kind of funny because he'll walk around and I, and I, will, I won't say the words, but it's as if he's walking around cursing under his breath, you know? Like, Zoe, that Zoe, you know? I, <laughs> I can just smell her following me, you know? <laughs> he's just, and then he'll get over it, but it, he's pretty comical, he's funny. Anyway. his face <laughs> this is the time when he goes to sleep in a blanket Let's see there he is he's very cute he's really funny um sorry um so, yeah uh two more questions actually um sure. one is saying that their um four-year-old dog is blind from a retina injury and needs um, a lot of eye medications and um the person is wondering whether piglet needs uh, special eye drops or lubrications right? Actually, he does not. And that is, it's not unusual, but there are dogs with his genetic situation, double dapple, which causes what's called collie eye anomaly, which is a, a, a group of congenital defects that happen in the eye. So a lot of the dogs have really runny eyes, or they might end up with um, Ubiitis, which is inflammation in the eye that can lead to glaucoma. Some of them have, can, that 
are, have partial vision might end up with cataracts. So though there are um, situations where dogs like this will need eye meds, this dog at the moment doesn't. His eyes have plenty of tears. They don't run. His tear ducts must be working. And they aren't inflamed at the moment. <laughs> so I hope they stay that way, but that is always a risk. Okay, and um, then one more question. Um, someone's wondering whether or not buying the book will contribute to the nonprofit organization um, or if the book play and direct donations are the way to raise money for, for your nonprofit. Like what's the best way to contribute? Basically? Okay, well, buying the book helps us sell more books, which brings our message to more people and encourages stores and online outlets to purchase more books Put the book up into a more prominent place so we sell more books if we sell enough books that we make a profit then a portion of the profits will go into the nonprofit. but currently i am uh i do i am offering book plates that are signed which look like this so i had a picture on on the on the powerpoint but you can see uh, this one is not signed by me, but it has Piglet's uh, little paw print on there, and then I, I'm signing it also. Uh, I'm offering them through the nonprofit as a gift for the donation, so that way the donation is tax deductible and the money goes straight into our platform, fundraising platform for the nonprofit. So it's, I, the, I use Network for Good as the, as the platform. So if you go to the website, pigletmindset.org, and you go to the books tab at the top, there's a drop down, and book plates is one of the drop downs. So you can go to the book plate drop down and see that if you give a donation, there's a button to go straight to the donation platform. $15 or more, feel free to give more, but $15 is the minimum. And uh, then, once the donation is made, take a screenshot of the invoice and send it to me at pick at uh, what is it book plates. This is all on there, so you can you'll be able to see the instructions. But it's it's actually very simple. Um, so you take a screenshot of the uh, invoice or the uh, the receipt for the donation, it, and then that gets sent to Piglet Book Plates at Gmail. So this is all on there, all the instructions. And then once I get the email with your name and address. I will uh, personalize a book plate and send it to you anywhere in the world. Yeah, Warren? I feel like I'm in class. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I think we want people to buy the book. Yes. Because it'll raise awareness of Piglet Mindset. It'll give you a bigger platform. Melissa, you should talk a little bit quickly about these amazing teachers from Canada and New Zealand and Australia and America and the UK who are just sending the most amazing messages to you. Okay, I agree. The book plates are available, go to the website. We wanna sell the book, I agree. And I really wanna sell Piglet Mindset which is being sold through the book. Uh, nothing, I've done no project in my whole life that comes close to the Piglet Mindset project. So this little presentation is just a taste of what the kids are getting. If you go to the website, it's there. You can, you don't have to be a teacher to look at this. It's all free. It's all on the website, Piglet Mindset Educational Program, Outreach Program. The teachers send me notes and they tell me, and I've been doing this for four years. This is going into the fifth year, the fifth school year. And this year in particular, I, because of COVID, I think primarily the kids are back in school, a lot of them. And the teachers, I got a, a note from a teacher who is in um, California telling me that she found, uh, found out about us just a few days before school started. Uh, one teacher read about it in the book. It, it, everyone's finding out about Piglet Mindset Educational Program. And the, the one teacher said that she she decided to have the whole theme of the classroom piglet and piglet mindset. So she has the uh, coat hanger 
uh, whatever it's called, where the, where the coats are hung, that shelf area, all decorated in piglet and piglet mindset, words and encouragement. She decided to have all of her team tables so that she had six tables in her room. Instead of having team whatever, she's having it be Annie's pack, Susie's pack, Zoe's pack. So she's using all of the six dogs to as the team names. And she has their picture on all the tables, Annie's pack. She sent me the picture of Annie and it says Annie's pack on it. And then she um, had them all do Piglet Mindset posters. And she, what she said though, that was most meaningful of course in her email was that the kids are very, very enthusiastic and embracing Piglet Mindset, which is blowing her mind and mine as well, which she told me because she said that the kids are being more kind to each other than ever. When she pairs them into reading pairs or whatever, no one complains about who they're with. When a kid is saying, a, a kid said, oh, that the math assignment was very hard. Another kid said to them, we have a piglet mindset, it'll be fine. And this is the email that I got. Today, I got an email from somebody who is a teacher of deafblind students in Texas, and she's going to use Piglet Mindset with her, with her kids. And the, the, the emails just come in numerous times a week of teachers that want are going to use Piglet Mindset. They want to know, a, a teacher in Canada want to know how to join the program. And I have on the desk here these. Um, the stickers and the um, Piglet's inclusion pack cards. I pack them up and I send them and then we will reconvene with a uh, virtual visit. So I am, I, I can't even believe I get to do this. It's really a lot of fun, but having a dog that I did not want to keep and promising that he'd have a productive, meaningful life gave him a meaningful life and me much more meaning in my life as I bring this message of positivity and acceptance and inclusion and being kind to kids all around the world. So I hope that everyone here will join in one capacity or another. If you have friends that are teachers, uh, friends that want to read a book about all of this so that they can then encourage others. We're here. Is that okay, Warren? Yeah. Well, Melissa, thank you so much for sharing Piglet and your Very story nice. with us all. So cute. <laughs> thank you so much for sharing and um, thanks for letting us help you get word out about all the wonderful work that you do. And um, um, and as I, you know, as I mentioned, the, this program was recorded, so it'll be on our um, the library YouTube channel. So if anyone wants to share it, they're welcome to direct them to that. And um, and thank you so much to everyone for joining us this evening. So. Thank you. Thanks for having us. We love to we love to talk piglet. Warren does too. My parents are here. <laughs> <laughs> and they're in the book too. My parents are in the book. So I hope if there, anyone's on here that hasn't bought the book, you have no excuse now. <laughs> okay, well, thank you again. Thanks for having us, really. It was a lot of fun. Good night, everybody.